Um, Fiona and I both actually trained in medicine uh, and then pursued very different careers. I went on to become a psychiatrist and Fiona to become, good evening, uh, an endocrinologist. Um, the fact that we're actually sharing a platform today is, I think, indicative of the fact that what we're going to talk about is really bringing quite disparate fields together in a new and unusual way. And this notion that the brain and the psychology really does listen to what the body is telling it is becoming very current in, in my field of psychiatry now. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to air a few ideas. So to begin with, um, Fiona, who is uh, a world expert on uh, gut hormones and gut signaling, is going to tell you all about that, and then I will spend half an hour telling you about how the brain listens to those signals. So... The question that I think we're going to be pondering is this sort of question of, shall I eat another one? I've already had one donut, two donuts, three donuts. But what is it that helps us to make that decision about whether we're full or whether we just want to, to eat more? And is it just a decision that the brain makes on its own? Or is it a decision that the brain makes in the context of all the other things that are happening around the body? And there are lots of places around the body where signals could be making it to the brain to tell the brain what is happening. So I'm just going to take you, you through the possible places. The idea, by the time I've finished talking, I hope, is that I will have told you a bit about gut hormones, a bit about gut hormones and diabetes, and a bit about bypass surgery. So by the time you've heard me talk about bypass surgery, I'll be stopping, so then you can start to relax. So, first place that food makes it and that we can detect it is in the mouth. And you know that the mouth is full of these taste receptors. It's actually very good at detecting what we're eating, whether it's sweet, whether it's fatty, whether it's um, salty or sour. But it's not so good about actually sending a message to the brain to say, I'm full. It's more saying what is the quality of what we're eating rather than sending a message to say, I've eaten a lot and now it's time to stop eating. So we'll put this, the, the um, mouth aside for the moment. The next place the food reaches is the stomach. And the stomach is actually very important. So, so the stomach is this, depending on how much you've eaten, it's a, it's a sort of muscular sac. And it's a holding zone. The food goes into it. It can stretch and stretch and stretch up. And then its purpose is actually just to churn up the food, to grind it up, mix it with acid, mix it with enzymes, and start breaking it all down. The more you eat, the more the stomach stretches. And in the wall of the stomach, in that muscular wall, there are lots of fine nerve endings, and the nerve endings detect stretch. And so when your stomach stretches, it sends nervous signals up to the brain to say the stomach is full. And I think we all recognize that sense of having a full stomach from when you've eaten a large meal. You really do detect quite a lot of what you've eaten by how full your stomach is feeling. So stomach is an important place for detecting food. Then, bottom left-hand corner, this is the intestines, and this is my preferred area of talking about. Now, it looks small and mean in this picture, but I always bring this with me to a public lecture. This is our knitted gut, and it's a life-size human knitted gut, and you can see how fanatical we are down the Institute of Metabolic Science to knit stupid things like human guts. So Paul is going to take that over there. <laughs> right? <laughs> Whoops. Now it's, it fills up with marbles so we can, we can put, children can put their marbles through them. This is, the, this is the mouth, this is the liver, this is the stomach. And this long pink thing is roughly a life-size small intestine, this long pale thing. And the reason I show you that is, why on earth do we have a small intestine that has five to seven metres long? I think, Paul, you don't have to stand there for the rest of this. Um, why can't we manage with one metre? No, what are two metres, but seven metres? I think that's something saying something very important about what this small intestine is for. And what it is for is what your body absolutely wants to do is every nutritious particle that you put in your mouth 
it wants to get out of your guts and into your bloodstream. It doesn't want to waste any of it in the faeces. It wants to absorb everything. And so, as the food moves down this small intestine, it gets digested further, it gets broken down into all the small components, the amino acids and the glucose, and it gets absorbed. However, what would happen if food starts to get to the other end of the small intestine without having been absorbed? And that's where the intestine starts to produce signals, because if food had made it right to the other side of the room there and wasn't being absorbed, then a signal needs to go to say, food's entering this too fast. And what the body does, what the intestine does, is actually to produce hormones. It releases hormones that want to reduce the amount of food that's getting in the intestines. And there's two ways they can do that. One, they can send a message to the brain to say, you're eating too much. Please stop pouring food in the top end because I can't cope with it down the bottom end. The other thing it can do is to send a message to this opening of the stomach here. So this is where the stomach empties um, the food into the small intestine. If it clamps down that opening, the food gets kept in the stomach. And there's only then a small trickling of food down into the small intestine. And this is actually a very important mechanism because obviously then if you, if you clamp down the opening from the stomach, you keep your stomach fuller for longer. So the hormones have those different methods of action. One is just to say to the brain, well, Paul can tell you how much the brain actually listens, but they're trying to say to the brain that it's time to stop eating, that they're full. And the other thing is to stretch up the stomach a bit more by, by holding the food in there. Then there are two other places I want to mention. So one, what about when the nutrients get into the bloodstream? Um, so sugars and amino acids get into the bloodstream, and there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest that that can actually act as a signal to the brain, and the brain can detect these circulating levels and respond to them. It's still quite a young area of science, and I don't think we really fully understand how important it is. And finally, down in the bottom right-hand picture, you might know what, not know what this is, but it's supposed to be fat cells. So it's not related to the gut, but I think it's important. So when you fill up your fat stores, when they get full, they produce this hormone called leptin, and leptin tells the brain it's time to stop eating. If you start reducing your fat stores by under-eating, they produce less leptin, and then you get very hungry. So this fat stores are more of a long-term sort of... They, they supply signals sort of long-term control of, of energy balance. So just to then put this intestine... Um, just to remind you where we got to. So food enters the top end, stomach stretches. Very important signal um, carried by the nerves, and it goes to the brain to say... You have got food in the intestine. You don't need to be eating anymore. There are a lot of hormones that the um, gut produces. This is just four of them that I've mentioned, but actually there are at least 20 different hormones the guts produce. I don't think we really know why they produce so many, but they have a lot of different functions, so it's probably related partly to the lots of different roles they play. The brain can detect them, partly because they circulate through the bloodstream and they reach the brain, partly because they activate some of the nerves that go up to the brain. Um, another thing I've said they do is to affect the opening of the stomach, clamp it down so you get more of the stretch. And then there's another really important thing that they do, which is to signal to the pancreas. So the pancreas has two roles. One is to produce digestive enzymes, the other is to produce insulin. And when you've got lots of sugar entering your bloodstream, the body needs to deal with it by producing more insulin. If it doesn't produce insulin, that's when you get diabetes. So the gut needs to tell the pancreas that there are sugars arriving in the bloodstream and it needs to deal with those sugars and not let sugars in the bloodstream go up too high. This turned out to be very important. So this was discovered, um, particularly this one hormone called GLP-1 is the one I'm going to tell you a bit more about. It was discovered in the early 1990s that if you took GLP-1 and injected it into people, I mean, that's quite a brave experiment to do, but it wasn't me who did it. So you take the GLP-1, you inject it into people who have diabetes, and their insulin concentrations went up and their blood sugars went down. It actually almost restored the normal insulin production of people. This is adult-onset diabetes I'm talking about. So it, it restored their insulin production. And on the basis of that, academics went to industry and said, there's this fantastic hormone you need to deal with. Um, 
you're not going to be able to work with GLP-1 itself because the body breaks down GLP-1 very quickly. But if you can make molecules that are like GLP-1 but are much more stable, you can make a new treatment for diabetes. And they did. So now, I don't know if any of you do have type 2 diabetes. Um, if you do, um, and if you're overweight, you might have been offered these GLP-1-based treatments as a treatment for your diabetes. They've turned out to be phenomenally successful. Um, they're injections, so you have to inject them once or twice a day, although the newer formulations you inject once a week. And one reason they've turned out to be so successful is because people who've been put on them actually lose weight. So if you look at this plot of how much people lost weight in some of the early trials of these, there are people losing 20, 30 kilograms of weight just from treating their diabetes with this um, hormone GLP-1 or a derivative of the hormone GLP-1. And actually, based on those clinical studies, um, these treatments, the first of these treatments has now actually been licensed as a treatment for obesity. It was licensed in other countries and it's just coming into the UK um, this year, I think. So it's a hormone that you can use to treat diabetes, but you can also now, will soon be able to use it as a treatment for, for being overweight because it is in some way sending signals to the brain to tell the brain that the body is full and it doesn't need to be eating anymore. I'm pressing the wrong button. So, the one thing I think that has... So, so GLP-1 was discovered, but why do we keep on working on it? And the thing that's kept us going has been some amazing discoveries from gastric bypass surgery. So I'm going to tell you a bit about gastric bypass surgery and how it works and why it's so exciting in this field of gut hormones talking to the brain. And to do that, this is a Cambridge lecture. I'm going to give you just a little bit of a lecture at the same time. So you, you're here, you can't escape. So, so this is my depiction of the gut, and I've put arrows on it just to show that it really is a lecture. So I've already shown, pointed out the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon. The pancreas I've labelled here, I've already told you, the pancreas does two things. It produces insulin, and it produces enzymes that help you digest the food. And these, it empties the enzymes into this part of the small intestine called the duodenum. This is the liver, and this is the gallbladder, which holds bile. Um, and the bile also enters the gut up here with the, with the pancreatic enzymes. And you need these enzymes, and you need the bile to help you digest all the food. And it's important, and you'll see why it's important in a minute. This is what happens if you take a bit of small intestine and you open it up and you look at it down a microscope. It looks absolutely hideously disgusting, I think. Um, so these are what are called villi. They're little finger-like projections that project into the inside of the gut. They make the surface area much bigger for absorbing all the nutrients. Um, but they also, on the surface of them, they have... They have the cells that absorb the nutrients, um, but they also have the cells that make the hormones. So this is supposed to be a depiction of the surface of one of these villi. And these cells that I've put in blue are the, are the cells that produce the hormones. And what they do is they detect when food is being absorbed across that the epithelial layer, that surface layer of the intestine. And as the food is being absorbed through here, it stimulates the production of the hormones. And the hormones, the GLP-1, um, which I've already spoken about, and another hormone called peptide YY, which hit the, um, the press quite a few years ago when um, it was claimed that was going to be the new treatment for obesity. It's still in trials, but it isn't yet the new treatment for obesity. These are hormones that are produced lower down the gut, and they're some of the hormones, I said, that are produced when the food reaches the other side of the room, and it shouldn't be there, trying to signal back to the brain to, to um, close everything down. So, so that's how everything should work. Now what happens if you do bypass surgery? And there are many different forms of bypass surgery, so every surgeon can make his slightly own different procedure. However, I will talk about two types of, of bypass. Or, it's called bariatric surgery. It's also nowadays called metabolic surgery because it helps your metabolism. Um, there's one form that is a, a gastric band. Um, so this is where they, they put an adjustable band around the stomach. Um, the idea is it's a purely restrictive procedure. It restricts 
how the food passes from the esophagus here when you eat it down into the stomach. And if you have one of these, you just can't physically eat as much because the way is blocked for the food to pass through. There are consequences of that. One is that your stomach never fills up, so you never get that sense of fullness. Um, so that's not terribly satisfying. The other thing is that the, um, because the food is passing so slowly through the gut, because it's being restricted and you can't eat very fast, all the digestion and absorption happens fairly high up. That means none of it never really reaches this lower part of the gut where those gut hormones are being produced. So you also don't get a big change in gut hormones. So you don't get those signals to say you're full. So it works because it restricts the flow of, of food and how much you eat. But it doesn't do very much to satisfy feelings of hunger um, and to, by producing these gut hormones or stretching the stomach to make you feel full. So it works, but um, it has limitations. What people are usually talking about when they think about gastric bypass surgery is another form of surgery called a gastric bypass. This is my depiction of a gastric bypass, and you have to excuse my, my um, pictures. What the surgeons do is so it's keyhole surgery usually done. They make two cuts. They make one cut across the stomach, and they make one cut across this part of the intestine that's called the jejunum. And what they do is they take this bit of the jejunum just to the, the far side of the cut, and they join it on up here, and they take this part of the gut, and they join it on down there. So if you follow that, you'll see that you end up with something like this. So here's the part that was there gets joined on to this remnant of the stomach, and here's the part that was there that gets joined on lower down. So if you've had this procedure done, so the surgeon's had to go and he's had to do a bit of chopping and changing and moving around and joining one bit onto another. Now when you eat, the food takes a very different route through the gut. Um, so instead of going to the stomach and down this way, it goes into this small stomach pouch and then it whistles straight into a bit of, of what was slightly lower down, a few metres or at least a metre further down the, um, the intestine. Only at this point does it meet the bile and the pancreatic enzymes. So digestion of your fats and proteins isn't really going to start to happen until you get down here. And the consequence of that, I believe, is the major thing that is responsible for why gastric bypass surgery works is that you're now getting all your digestion and absorption at this lower part, the, the further down part of the gut. That means that your gut hormones go up much more. So normally after you've had a meal, GLP-1 goes up from about 10 to 20. Um, if you've had gastric bypass surgery and then you have the same meal, your gut hormones go up, your GLP-1 goes from about 10 to 100 or 200. It goes phenomenally high. GLP-1 goes up, peptide YY goes up, Another of these hormones that was marked on there were CCK. Many of them go up. And they do some fairly incredible things. Um, one thing that happens that has turned out to be absolutely extraordinary is that if you go in to have bypass surgery, this operation, because you're overweight, but at the same time you have type 2 diabetes, many people go into the operation with type 2 diabetes one or two days later, they walk out of the operation, diabetes gone. It's not just that it's got slightly better, it has melted away. So much so that the surgeons now will take people off all their diabetes medications and send them home because they say your diabetes will be gone. And that is absolutely incredible. Um, of all the diabetes, you know, we have lots of different drugs for treating diabetes, none of them will do that. Even if you mix them all together, they're not so good gastric bypass does the job. So guess what the search is on to find out is to work out if we could work out what it is that's really key about gastric bypass surgery and turn it into a new medication. Maybe it would be injectable, maybe it would be a tablet. Then obviously that's the, the holy grail really for treating diabetes. Um, problem is we don't think it's going to be a single factor. We know that the GLP-1 goes up massively. We know the PYY goes up massively. We also know that if you treat people with GLP-1, it doesn't do the same thing. So it's not just the GLP-1 that's doing the job. Um, 
And so the way we think that treatment is going to be heading probably is that it's going to be combination therapy. So, so the industry is out there at the moment testing mixtures of different hormones, of all the different hormones that go up. Maybe if you mix a bit of all of them, you'll have the same effect of bypass surgery. And I can't read this at the bottom, but, but the, a, another extraordinary thing that happens is that after this surgery, but not the banding, people come out of surgery and saying they don't feel hungry anymore. So it's not where it's this one where, where they're <laughs> desperate to eat but, but, but can't. When you have a real wide gastric bypass, you come out of it and say you're not feeling hungry anymore. People come up to clinic, apparently, um, and say, I used to eat burgers, now I only want a salad. What is happening? Because, you no, know, if you can reproduce that, you know, absolutely amazing treatment. And, and we don't really know what's happening, but we assume that it's something to do with these gut hormones being very high, um, the GLP-1 and the PYY. Some other things change as well. So, so bile acids change a lot. And actually, even just being on a very low-calorie diet, which people are after this, has some beneficial effects. Weight loss itself definitely affects, but weight loss doesn't do what bypass surgery does. So weight loss will help with type 2 diabetes, but the bypass surgery does phenomenal things on top of it. So in response to this question, shall I eat another one? I think the brain is making these decisions, but it's making its decisions in the context of a lot of signals from the body. There's this early response from the stomach, this stretch, nervous signal, I'm full, the one that we all recognize. There's this early to delayed response. So this actually kicks in within 15 minutes or so after eating, but it lasts up to about three hours, usually these, these gut hormone signals, depending on how much you've eaten. And actually, the more you eat things that are slowly digestible, you know, the, the grains, protein that you need to break down much more, the further it'll reach down the gut and the more of these hormone-producing cells it'll target, so the higher the gut hormones will be. So this is, a, this is a signal that really should be telling the brain, you ate an hour ago, two hours ago, three hours ago. There's still food entering your bloodstream at the moment, and, and the response to the brain, you know, theoretically, should be, you don't need to eat at the moment. You could delay it for another few hours. Um, and then there's these long-term signals coming from the fat cells that, that tell you these, about these long-term fat stores and try to keep your fat stores really constant over, over the years. So I think I have said enough, Paul, and now I can pass over to you to say that actually... The brain ignores all these signals, or, or not. I think the answer is we don't know, but um, let me pass over to Paul. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, so we'll continue seamlessly and then invite questions and comments when I've finished. Um, Fiona began and ended her talk with the question of decision-making. And I think stepping back for a moment and, and taking a look at decision-making is going to be key. So the, um, the standard approach, the, the sort of intuitive approach, the, the, the approach that we all sort of buy into about decision-making is really very simple. We have a set of goals and plans and things that we value or don't value. Uh, residing in our in our mind, our brain, uh, and when we're faced with choices, these goals and plans are weighed up, uh, uh, and we eventually go for the thing that has for us the most value, and that's what leads to the action. So the, the simple idea is that there's a rational process of weighing up the odds, choosing the action, and enjoying or not enjoying the consequences. And this simple idea which is really a sort of the metaphor is that the brain or the mind is the puppet master controlling everything about us floating above all these rather mundane physical things that we don't really need to worry ourselves about is is highly prevalent it's the framework that is really embedded in our own ideas about what's moral uh, what's legal uh, it's a central idea to what constitutes a legal or an illegal action or choice. 
Um, and it entails personal responsibility for the things we do. And what I've noticed over the time, certainly since I've been a medical student, is that it somehow seemed to invade the question of illness. Uh, there's a, there's an, a growing uh, sense, although probably if you scrutinise history, it's been there for a long time, a growing sense that uh, people are responsible uh, through their decisions and actions for their own state of health. Uh, and that's a responsibility that can sometimes have a sort of moral <coughs> tinge to it. Uh, the major diseases that are really troubling the World Health Organization are the non-communicable diseases, uh, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, cancer, diabetes. And these are all diseases which indubitably are shaped by and to some extent driven by the choices and behaviours that people engage in, their consumption of food, alcohol, tobacco, and their decisions about whether or not to take exercise to expend energy. Uh, and so what we see is that conditions in which uh, people are, for example, obese, are within this framework, <coughs> seem to be their own fault, seem to be, uh, seem to be some sort of problem of moral responsibility or willpower is the term that's used. And what, I, what intrigues me, because I don't think this framework works, is what, what if it is wrong? What if there's something controlling the puppet master? Um, and this can come from the outside, from the world around us, and that's what I'm going to spend the first few minutes talking about, but it can also come from within. And this is really what uh, Fiona has very nicely laid the ground for. So we can take a further step back and ask ourselves, um, what does the brain do? Now, I think that first and foremost, amongst all the other things it does, is the brain predicts things. Being a good predictor is, in terms of surviving and thriving, an incredibly good skill to have. It's better to be a good predictor than to be ferocious or fast or strong or nimble. If you're a good predictor, you get to where the good stuff is before anyone else, and you get away before all the bad stuff arrives. Uh, that's what prediction really helps you to do. Uh, and the brain is remarkably good at that. I think a simple principle for many of the processes that go on are about forming association and predicting what's going to happen. Now, a very interesting thing happens when the brain associates two, two things. Um, say that the, the, the stimulus, such as the apple tree, and the outcome that can be obtained from that stimulus or as a, as a consequence of that stimulus. And that is that the stimulus itself seems to acquire some of the properties of the, the outcome. If the stimulus is pleasant, it predicts something nice, then somehow that stimulus itself comes to be pleasant. And actually, if you look at what's happening in terms of firing within the dopamine system, you can see that initially... Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get this. Initially, uh, this, this region of the brain, which is intensively associated with rewards and motivation, gets very excited by rewards. But over the course of time, it gets just as excited, if not more so, by the things that predict the rewards. So the apple tree will engender activation in the dopamine system and the apple will no longer do so when it arrives. And if there's something else that predicts the apple tree, such as a sign saying orchard this way, then that comes to acquire the motivating properties, uh, the rewarding properties of the, of the outcome. So there's this idea that the brain more and more is actually becoming motivated and shaped by what there is out there in the world that is, is helping it to predict. And how might this manifest in behaviour? Well, if you look at pigeons, something very interesting happens. If a pigeon sees a light that predicts a nice food reward, so the light appears above it, here, and the reward appears in the, in the tray down here, then the pigeon starts to, when this has become an established relationship, the pigeon starts to attend to the light, and it starts to peck at it as though it were food. And interestingly, if there are two lights, one predicts food and the other predicts uh, a drink, then it will peck at the, the, the food-predicting light as though it were food, and it will predict, uh, peck at the drink-predicting light with its beak angled as though it were a drink. So there's something in the pigeon's brain that is associating those two lights with food and drink in more than just a predictive way, but as though they've come to acquire the motivational properties. Now, of course, you might argue that um, this doesn't seem terribly redolent of, of the way in which we as humans go about our day-to-day -day business, but of course it is. There are numerous stimuli in our world that can 
predict and therefore come to shape and drive our behaviour. And if you look at uh, children as young as three to five, this is a study done on the west coast of America, um, they were presented with reasonably healthy foodstuffs, um, plus some unhealthy ones. So they either had nice little raw carrot sticks or they had burgers. And those carrot sticks or burgers were presented either in plain wrapping or in uh, wrapping that was emblazoned with a McDonald's logo. Now, the, even though the foodstuffs themselves were identical, the children preferred the ones that were in the McDonald's wrapping. They ate more of it, and they said it tasted nicer. This is all down to the stimulus that does the predicting, that has acquired the motivational properties. And what this actually means is that thinking about the brain in the world is that there are two routes to action, not just this simple, you, weigh up the, you have your plans and goals, you weigh up the potential... Uh, values of the options and then you take your decision. Uh, that's one route, so you might see the sign, it makes you think of the burger and then you take the necessary action. But there's a quicker route to action and that is you see the sign, you take the action. The stimulus drives the action and that's known as habitual behaviour. And habitual behaviour actually is incredibly advantageous in so many ways because it takes out the middleman. It means that you can act fast in response to what you know rather than to what you particularly want at that time. But it has one big disadvantage, and that disadvantage is that it means that you're ceding control away from yourself to the environment. You're responding to stimuli. Habitual behaviour is inflexible and automatic. That makes it fast and efficient, but it also makes it potentially harmful, and it means giving up some of your autonomy. And it's not something we can do terribly much about. So that's the brain being controlled by the world. But the picture, of course, as we've heard, is much more complicated. So we have all of these magnetically attractive stimuli around us that are pulling at the brain. And then we have all these internal signals that are pushing at the brain. And the key question that's really being addressed here, and that I think will, will shape how we look at endocrine brain interactions in the future is how do these signals interact with each other? How can they come together to produce an even greater force? How do they compete with each other? So we're all aware of this happening. For example, um, if you're very, very hungry, then a food that you wouldn't normally be terribly attracted to might seem to become much more attractive. Something bland can actually seem I incredibly desirable. Alternatively, if you're not full, then even a food that you do like might become much less attractive. This is all very obvious day-to-day -day stuff. And then, of course, there's the possibility that these, these external pulls and the internal drives might compete. So you feel incredibly full after a meal, but then hoving into view out of the kitchen is the dessert trolley, and suddenly there's a little bit more room for you because these external pulls become so attractive. And so the question arises... What is it about these internal drives uh, that shape how the brain responds to these external pulls? And that's what I want to devote the rest of the, the presentation to. And really I'm harking back to a number of the things that, and, and ideas that Fiona has raised, but I'm going to ask the question, how does the brain respond to these effects? So this is a study that's um, relevant to uh, GLP-1 that Fiona mentioned. This is the the hormone secreted by the gut that seems to be associated with a great deal of reduction in blood sugar, increase in insulin, and uh, uh, the, the, the drug that mimics it can actually be a very good treatment for diabetes. So I'll just walk you through this slide. This is a study which looked at the degree to which a stimulus that predicts uh, a chocolate, a, a tasty chocolate um, slurp of milkshake uh, could drive brain activity. So this is not the activity in response to the milkshake itself. This is the activity in response to the stimulus that predicts it. So this gets back to this idea. And what you see is that this region of the brain, which I won't go into details, but it's associated with motivation, dopamine, and so forth, this gets quite excited by the, the predictive stimulus, and this could be seen as a sort of anticipatory activity. But actually, in people who have a higher BMI, people who are more prone to cravings, perhaps, uh, the activity tends to be higher. Now, you then give them this drug that mimics the GLP-1. And the interesting thing is that in several areas of the brain, including this one, the activity in response to that anticipation goes right down. So fundamentally, 
just presenting this, this, this drug to the system is actually changing how the brain is responding to the external world. Which gets back to the point that, uh, that Fiona was raising. Now you can also show that this is a relatively specific GLP-1 effect by presenting another drug that actually specifically blocks GLP-1 receptors and you no longer get this beneficial effect of, of the drug that mimics GLP-1. So the, the take-home message is that simply presenting a drug that acts like the hormone on the receptors can fundamentally shift the conversation that the brain is having with these predictive stimuli and shift the way in which those can actually pull the brain activity towards anticipatory desire or, or even craving. Uh, bariatric surgery, that seems to have a big effect upon your state of health potentially, does it have an effect on your brain? Well, this is a study that was done before and after bariatric surgery in three groups of people, well, in two groups of people and one group of controls. And they looked at this particular area, which is the dopamine center, or one of the dopamine centers of the brain, and they looked at the response to just pictures of highly palatable foods compared to rather more bland foods. And at baseline, uh, they, they, they compared surgery with, uh, post-surgery with activity at baseline. And what you see is that this ruan y gastric bypass, which Fiona described very nicely, the one that has all of these effects on PYY, GLP-1, and so forth, that seems to produce a big reduction in the amount of brain response to these highly palatable external stimuli. So the same message appearing that the brain is responsive to these stimuli, but the degree to which it's responsive is shaped by what's going on down here. Interestingly, um, if you can then block that hormonal change temporarily, you can actually, they revert back to the previous state wherein the blockage of the hormone, or the blockage of the um, effects using a, a, a substance called uh, octreotide, um, will reduce the levels of GLP-1 and PYY. In other words, um, reverse temporarily the effects of the gastric surgery, or the bypass surgery. This actually results in an increase in the desire for food, and you get a res an increase in the response to this, this brain area. So it does seem to be something to do with the hormonal response to the bariatric surgery. But it's not just the gut that, or sorry, it's not just the hormones through which the gut can communicate with the brain. And this is some very interesting, very speculative work. It's just out. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be replicated, but I thought I, I and, and I, to be quite frank with you, I don't know what it means at all. Um, but I thought it'd be worth sharing it with you because to me it's quite fascinating. The, the gut has its own internal rhythmicity. It's not very fast. It sort of slowly contracts about once every 20 seconds. The brain has its own internal oscillations. These are much faster. They can, these can go up to 70 hertz, uh, 70 times a second. So you've got two different levels of rhythmicity. And the question that was asked by this group was, is there something about what's going on in the gut that might actually have an impact on what's going on in the rhythmicity or the oscillations of the brain. And the striking phenomenon is this. If you look at the slow, sort of measured contractions of the gut, they, they go through several different phases, from being maximal right through to completely relaxed. And if you look at the phase that somebody's gut is in, measured using electrogastrography, gastrography, um, and, and place that alongside what's going on in their brain as measured by something called a, a magnetoencephalography, which we don't need to worry about, then actually the magnitude of, or the amplitude of these fast oscillations, these are, these are so-called alpha oscillations, about 11 hertz, is dependent upon the phase of the slow oscillation of the gut. There's something really strange going on here. It, the mere uh, expansion and contraction of the gut wall is somehow affecting oscillations in the brain that are thought to be very important for certain areas of cognition, such as perception and attention. I don't know what that means, but we can't ignore the fact that this, this message is, is coming through to us. And there are certain areas of the brain that particularly show this effect. Um, I've just flashed that uh, image up. I don't think it helps explain anything, but uh, it's a nice image. <laughs> People who do brain imaging always fall back on some sort of brain image at some point. And it's not just the gut. So Fiona, I, I, I thought it would be quite important to, 
put up this slide as well. Uh, Fiona mentioned the fat cells which <coughs> produce this uh, hormone called leptin. Now, leptin, uh, as she mentioned, seems to go up when you're eating, and that seems to be a signal to stop eating. Now, it's possible that you can, if you're very unlucky, uh, from the earliest stage, not be able to produce any leptin. It's a very rare condition, very interesting condition, but also potentially a tragic condition, because the person who fails to produce leptin is always starving. They will eat and eat and eat from an early age, and this can be life-threatening. Fortunately, thanks to work done uh, in Fiona's unit by uh, Sadaf Faruqi and Steve Rahali and others, um, it's, been, uh, it's been possible to diagnose this leptin deficiency and to replace the leptin of the individual with enormously uh, beneficial clinical effects. So this is the same individual a um, couple of years later. And it's very really striking talking to somebody who's leptin deficient. They almost talk about food as in the same way that somebody with a cocaine addiction would think about and talk about cocaine. There's an inability to wrest their attention away from anything that isn't food. Uh, I remember talking to one young woman and she said she could be sitting reading a physics book and there'll be something, some phrase there that will just make her think of food. She simply couldn't take her mind off it. And the consequence of that is a continual desire to eat to great excess. Now, we were able to take a couple of individuals who were about to be started on leptin treatment, and we put them in the brain scanner, and we were able to um, scan them, looking at these images of highly palatable food both before and after the leptin treatment, one week after leptin, before they'd lost any weight, before they'd really noticed any clini clinical benefit. But the striking thing is that... The amount of activity, and again, this same dopaminergic, motivation-related areas, uh, is very high in the leptin-deficient state when they look at images of high-calorie, highly palatable foods, but it's suppressed in response to leptin treatment, just a week later. Um, and the striking thing, yet again, we're seeing is that the brain is, in these individuals, under the influence of the highly attractive, magnetically attractive stimuli out in the world. Just pictures of food, not real foods. It's enough to really drive activity. Um, but the degree to which it is sensitive to those stimuli is fundamentally altered by the levels of a hormone that's secreted by the fat cells. So this conversation between brain and world is fundamentally altered by the conversation between the fat cells or the gut and the brain. Um, it's worth ending there. So these are some of the several people who fund mine and uh, Fiona's, Fiona's work and who indeed have funded this evening, I believe. Um, so I think th the message that I'd like to leave you with before we sit down and take some questions is it's very easy to uh, introspect and to think about how we make our decisions. And we tend to come up with explanations that really are expressed in a very rational, logical term. We know what's valuable to us. We know that we also have things that we particularly like. And ultimately, our decisions are based upon some weighing up or scaling of those, of those values. And in doing so, we're taking responsibility for our actions, even if we don't particularly want to. I would argue that actually that is just a very small part of the picture, that the world itself is often wresting our control from us by driving us with stimuli that occur below the radar of conscious processing and can push us in different directions. And I think that some people are more or less sensitive to those stimuli. But on top of that, that brain-world conversation is being fundamentally shifted by what the gut is telling us and what other parts of the body is telling us telling and signaling to the brain. Uh, and of course, there may be huge amounts of variability in those signals as well. So the overarching picture is one of hideous complexity, but it's one that at least we're rec beginning to recognize now. And on that note, I think it would be good to have some comments and questions. Thank you.